How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donahue here again. This time we're going to take a look at chemical bonds, Lewis symbols, and the octet rule. So our objectives will be to describe the different types of chemical bonds, evaluate electron configurations, draw Lewis dot diagrams, and apply the octet rule while being aware of its limitations. So let's start with types of bonds. We got chemical bonds. And the definition of that is just simply when atoms are strongly attracted or attached to one another. They're stuck together. They're bonded together. So metallic bonds occur between metal atoms. So metals are bonding to metals. And the reason they're bonded together is because of these communal electrons that travel throughout the whole solid. So if we had some electrons here, they're not stuck just around one of those atoms. They travel throughout the whole solid. And all of those atoms are sharing their valence electrons with every other atom. So you end up getting these uh, shared mobile electrons which is also why metals are highly conductive and have luster. It's those mobile electrons that allow them to conduct electricity. So for ionic solids, that occurs when we have metals bonding to nonmetals. Electrons are being transferred. So the example is if I had sodium that has one valence electron and chlorine that has seven, what ends up happening is one of those electrons from sodium is being transferred to the chlorine. So chlorine ends up with eight and sodium loses one. And because electrons are negatively charged, the chlorine becomes negatively charged and the sodium becomes positively charged. Now those opposite charges attract to each other. So opposites attract and that's the electrostatic attraction. That's ionic bonding in a nutshell. Now covalent bonding usually occurs when nonmetals are bonded to other nonmetals. So in this case, electrons are being shared. So say, for example, hydrogen has one valence electron and this hydrogen has another valence electron and they want to, they go, hey, I'll share mine with you if you share yours with me. And then they end up with the amount of electrons that they want. So bonding and valence electrons, kind of sneak peek already. But regardless of what type of bonding, it tends to only be concerned with the valence electrons. So if I'm looking at sulfur, we have these core electrons that have the same configuration as neon. And then we have these third energy level electrons. These are the valence electrons. These are the ones that are interacting and bonding with other atoms. So this guy, Lewis, came around and he was like, well, it, you know, here's a nice way to show just the valence electrons. If we're concerned with just the valence electrons, what? Let's, let's come up with a simpler way. So you start with the chemical symbol. So for sulfur, symbol is S. Boom, easy enough so far. Next, you picture a box around it. There's four sides around that S. There's a top, right? There's a bottom, there's a left, and there's a right. So we got four sides imaginary around that sulfur. Now, one dot will represent a valence electron. So if I take a look at the valence electrons for sulfur, I have a total of six valence electrons. So I gotta put one dot around each or one dot for each electron around the sulfur. And you can have up to two on each side. And where you double up first, is it doesn't really matter. It's arbitrary. So six, I go, all right, one, two, three, four. Now I got to put two more dots and it doesn't really matter where you put them, but I like putting them there, right? So there, that's my Lewis dot diagram for sulfur. That's what it's also known as, Lewis dot diagrams. Now note, each group, like on the periodic table, have the same number of valence electrons. So for example, if I was looking at oxygen, oxygen's in the same group as sulfur, and you can see it also has six valence electrons. So oxygen's dot diagram is gonna look really similar. You're gonna have six dots around the symbol for oxygen. A little practice, I dare you. Try drawing the Lewis dot diagrams for these elements. Pause it, try it, Check it, ready to go. All right, so starting with lithium, we're only concerned with the valence electrons. So this 1s2, we're not really concerned with. We want the outermost electron shell. So we got lithium and it has one valence electron. So you put a dot over it, there you go. Boron, same thing, not interested in the core electrons, just the valence electrons. So I write the symbol for boron and I draw one, two. Now. Sometimes you'll also see it written like this because sometimes people want to show that these are in the S orbital together, but it's, uh, 
it's okay either way, really. Now phosphorus, same deal. Find the valence shell, ignore everything else, write the symbol for phosphorus, and how many valence electrons do I have here? I have five. So I go one, two, three, four, and five, and there's my dot diagram for phosphorus. And then argon, same deal. We have core electrons we're not concerned with, and we have, this time, eight valence electrons. This is why we got four sides with up to two on each side. So I gotta go one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, and eight. And there's my Lewis structure for argon. So the octet rule. Atoms tend to gain or lose or share electrons until they have eight valence electrons. So now noble gases have eight valence electrons, except for helium, which only has two. So noble gases, I've abbreviated NG over in this image over there, right? So noble gases, eight valence electrons. They have a full S and P subshell. So if I'm looking at neon specifically, you can see in the valence electrons, the S and the P subshell are full. Argon, another noble gas, same deal. The S and the P subshell are full. Now the reason helium is an exception is because it doesn't have a P sublevel. Helium is just one S two. In that example, the S is full, which is why noble gases tend to be so unreactive. This state is really stable because the S and the P are full. It doesn't want to gain anymore. It doesn't want to lose anymore. It's got the full S and P. So what does that mean for ionic bonding? Well, for ionic bonding, sodium's gonna transfer one, right? If we take a look, it's got one extra electron compared to neon's noble gas configuration. So, you know, if it hung out with chlorine, chlorine needs one more electron to reach a noble gas configuration. So, hey, they're gonna pair up. Sodium's gonna lose its electron to chlorine. And now, sodium has the same electron configuration as neon and chlorine has the same configuration as, I think it's argon, the next noble gas. With covalent bonding, it's a little different. We're not transferring electrons. What oxygen's doing in this example is going, hey, I only have six, you only have six. How about I share some of mine with you? You share some of yours with me, and together, it'll be like we each have eight. So they go, all right, well, I'm gonna donate one pair of electrons and another pair, and then these ones in the middle are shared between both atoms. So both atoms think that they have those electrons, which get them to eight and have that full S and P subshell by sharing them. Exceptions, of course, right? What's chemistry without these rules that have a million exceptions to them? Well, more on this later, all right? We're not gonna jump into it too much right now. Just know that they exist. There are exceptions. Here's a couple of images like here, uh, you know, boron, only has six valence electrons from the, the bonds. Sulfur here has got more. Know that they exist. Uh, don't panic too much about them yet. So summarize, can you describe the different types of chemical bonds? Can you evaluate electron configurations? Can you draw loose dot diagrams? And can you apply the octet rule while being aware of its limitations? I hope so. Okay, bye.